Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the service tonight, if you will. Stand, please, and let's sing number two in our hymn book. Number two. <coughs> pray together. Father, we are blessed people today as we think about uh, who uh, we were without you and how you loved us and saved us and what we have in Jesus Christ today, tomorrow, and forever. Uh, Lord, we are blessed people, and so we thank you for the opportunity just to join together here in like faith and, uh, Lord, to just uh, sing these songs which prepare our heart just to open up to uh, to, to consider and to just think about and be strengthened through, uh, through the truth of uh, the things we've, uh, uh, that the, these songs have caused us to consider. And Lord, we can prepare our heart for your word and 
Uh, Lord, we can just uh, worship you and give you praise and thank you for your grace and goodness to us. Bless the folks that are here and these families. We just pray you'll hedge them in and keep your hand on their lives, meet their needs. Uh, Lord, we uh, pray, Father, for your will uh, to be done in every uh, life and family. And Lord, we just ask you to uh, provide and give direction and uh, help, Lord, where uh, decisions need to be made and, uh, and paths need to be chosen. And so, Lord, we just look to you for wisdom. And we thank you for uh, the children's ministries tonight. Bless them, our bus workers and nursery workers. Uh, folks who are volunteering, Lord, to serve you. We just thank you for them. Bless and use them tonight. We just ask again now uh, your blessings and thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated and it is a good place to be and we're glad to see you tonight and it has been just an exceptional day today and uh, we're thankful for that as we move now toward the weekend that we've anticipated for a while and that's uh, Easter weekend and uh, Sunday we'll celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ with special things throughout the day for uh, all of our services. Sunday school hour will be a good day uh, time and then our morning services where our choir will be singing and children's ministries have special uh, things that they'll be doing and then Sunday evening as well we'll have our observance of the Lord's Supper so it'll be a great day and we hope that you'll be able to be here and I pray you're planning on inviting someone to come and be your guest. Uh, be sure to pray about the ministries and activities that are in our uh, bulletin there. We list many of the things that are going on here throughout the week uh, through the life and ministry of your church. And so pray about those things. And then we do encourage you to be in Sunday school. We just started in our class an introductory lesson just laying down some foundational truth for a study of the miracles, some of the miracles of Christ. And uh, we'll be concluding that uh, foundational message on uh, Sunday morning and then we'll begin following then with looking at some of the individual miracles that Christ performed <clears throat> in, uh, in God's word and so we invite you to be a part of a Sunday school class here at our church we've got several names of folks that are on our prayer list here uh, starting off a new month and we kind of uh, start off here with a, a new prayer list but we want to add to it and so maybe you have something tonight you'd like for us to be in prayer about uh, anyone uh, tonight have something you'd like to add there to our prayer list? Lana's husband Mike. Okay. 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 Okay, so the Thompson family. And uh, your nieces, the Millers. Okay, all right. All right. Uh, does anybody else have something you'd like to put on there tonight? Be praying about the services. Sunday is a great, a great day, a special day, uh, opportunity during that day that we may not have every other Sunday out of the year. So hope you'll be praying for that uh, special day and, and just look to the Lord there to help you uh, to just grow and inviting and, and uh, asking people to be your guests on that day. Uh, anyone else have somebody tonight like to put on there? All right, well... Uh, we want to pray about these things for just right through the week from Wednesday to Wednesday. And uh, we also want to receive our offerings here on a Wednesday night, our tithes, which God has uh, commanded that we should give, and then also offerings to support missions, world evangelism. And I hope that you're giving a mission offering and investing in the uh, work of the Lord. Uh, John, could you and Drew help us with that tonight? be a blessing that taken care of and uh, one of these men will pray for us and we'll remember these prayer requests and uh, and uh, just uh, look to the Lord there this evening
Yeah. Appreciate the music today and uh, special uh, songs that uh, we sang. The choir songs are good, the congregational songs. And that first song, I just thought about it <clears throat> while uh, Dad leading that song. He did exactly what you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to do, and what they teach you in Bible college to do. And uh, which I didn't go away to a Bible college. I had a correspondence Bible college while I worked part time, and Angie was working and. Lydia was just a baby, uh, and, uh, which they don't call it that anymore. It's online classes, but it wasn't online then. They didn't have online classes, and uh, I got uh, I applied, and I when I when I knew the Lord was going to move us into the ministry, I wanted to prepare for it, and uh, so uh, I uh, I. Uh, enrolled at a Bible college and seminary that's in Dothan, Alabama, and uh, it was a, a, a reputable one, and I knew men who had studied that course and, and were pleased with what they got, and so you, you paid up front the full amount, and they mailed you an entire bachelor degree course of study uh, in binders, and so I had to uh, study those courses, and then uh, you did all your work typing it out on papers and then you would mail that back and get your grades and back and forth and back and forth. And some of the classes that I have, I have, I have all my classes in binders because the papers that I had to turn in nearly filled one of these. And, uh, you know, people say, well, you know, that was the easy way out. No, uh, they, I think they make you do twice the study and, and the writing to do it that way. But you study music leading services and those kind of things, and they tell you never choose a song with four verses for a congregational song. They say it's just too long, it's draggy, and so Dad dropped the verse out. But one of the things that I thought was interesting and uh, is uh, it got brought up that uh, uh, you know of all the things in the world to be, you would never want to be the third verse of a hymn in a Baptist hymn book. <laughs> Because you're always getting dropped out of everything. And I don't know why that made me think about that, but but it's pretty true, and that's what you wouldn't want to be. But uh, we are thankful for that. And uh, one of these Wednesday nights, I know that Dad and John need to perform and, and play for us. They just need to plan on on doing that maybe next Wednesday. So I'll give you a week in advance warning. So <laughs> there you go. Right, you'll have some wind. Uh, <laughs> win there, so uh, so uh, I know some of the ladies already had a preview of that. I think, but uh, the rest of us would enjoy that. So, so I, I heard about that. Yeah, I can't wait to hear it. So, so we're thankful for that, and uh, and that's a blessing to have those folks. 
uh, it could be that we could use a little. Uh, I hope maybe by just raking it up and kind of fluffing it around, we can do some good. But uh, you know, it, I, I would never turn that, turn it down uh, if we needed some. But uh, we did a pretty good job last year of getting everything covered and coated. But you know, through the course of the winter and the snow and everything that piles up on it, it just kind of gets flattened out. And so we just kind of weed it and rake it up real good and kind of spread it around. And it, it does look better that way, but but uh, yeah, that would be that be a blessing. So so don't forget about that. That's this coming Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, weather permitting. If it looks like it's going to be a washout, we'll try to just church cast that out so you don't make a trip up for nothing. <clears throat> but uh, we're going to try to get out and do that. We've got a lot of our landscaped areas, of course, need weeded out from the winter time. And uh, we do have some, uh, some bulbs that are blooming, some daffodils up, and some uh, the little purple looks like grapes. So those uh, hy hyacinth, is that what they're called, uh, coming up. So, uh, so I'll have to tell some of the men, don't weed the flowers out, right? Ladies, you've all had to say that before to your husband. Uh, don't, uh, don't weed eat the flowers down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> already said that already. So, but we'll get some things done, and, and uh, I want uh, and hope our uh, folks will, uh, will, folks will just uh, uh, come up on Sunday morning to church, and it'll just feel like a special day, uh, all the way around. So that's uh, Saturday morning at nine o'clock. If you needed to bring a tool at all, probably just a rake, and uh, some uh, gloves if you wanted to, and we'll uh, won't take long to get those things taken care of. Don't forget tomorrow evening also is, a, is an important day. And uh, I think if we make an investment tomorrow night that we can see a return on Sunday. And, if, and we want to get out in our community. We've got about six sections of uh, the village marked off on maps. And we want to get in there and just pass out a special Easter uh, invitation to the families there to come and join us on Sunday morning for, uh, for our Celebrate the Resurrection services and to hear our special music and <clears throat> all these things. And so I hope you can come and be with us. And uh, this is a great way to begin to grow in your personal life. And we've been talking about uh, being soul conscious and having compassion and, and uh, compassion that moves us to action and not just being concerned, but being moved and involved personally and engaging the lost like the Lord Jesus did. And so tomorrow night is a great night to do that. Uh, you come out. We'll meet at 6.30 in the ministry building. We'll have some material for you and get you matched up with folks and in groups, and we can get out and take care of that. And if we just knocked on doors an hour with a good group of people out, uh, we, could, uh, we could contact uh, several hundred different homes and it wouldn't take very long at all. So I hope you can come and, and uh, come out and be a part of that tomorrow evening. Uh, of course, the choir is presenting music on Sunday morning, and we're going to finish the final message there in our Glory on the Cross uh, series. And, uh, and uh, so these are all exciting things as we look toward Easter Sunday. We do have our first uh, Faithful Men's Fellowship breakfast scheduled there for April 18th, and I'm looking forward to getting those started back up again. And and uh, you can notice our background this year, our logo is kind of, is like a set of blueprints. And so we're going to be looking into God's word and find uh, there some direction that men need in our lives. And so I hope that our men will come out and be a part of those uh, faithful men's fellowship starting Saturday, uh, April 18th. And then if you'll notice, if you normally take part in the joy uh, trips and activities, uh, the the slide we had up here, I just added the words a date change, and you'll notice that instead of being uh, the 14th, which I think was originally marked on the calendar on that Tuesday, I'm moving it to win uh, till Thursday the 16th, and I hate to do that at such late notice, but I've got an opportunity to go to a pastor's conference, a pastor's meeting in Charleston, and uh, the fellow that's doing this uh, is from California, and he's coming in. And for two days, Monday and Tuesday, they're going to uh, have uh, some meetings and some services and training and, and some things for pastors. And I don't do that very often or don't get to do that very often. And I always wanted to go uh, to one of those meetings, but I knew that it wasn't ever going to happen with it being in California. And uh, so since they're doing one locally, I want to try to get in on that. And that's Monday and Tuesday of that week. 
13th and 14th. And so I, I'm just going to move that uh, joy trip back to Thursday. And we're just going to have breakfast together that day at the Cracker Barrel. And so that will be a great time to go, ladies, with lots of pretty spring stuff up there probably in the shop for sale. And uh, so it will be a good time to go. But uh, we're thankful for these things. So don't forget any of these uh, things. Be a part. Be involved in them. And uh, just let the Lord use you uh, here as he desires to and wants to. Uh, well, on Wednesdays, we always like to take a minute and see if someone maybe has a, I think Brother Jimmy said, does your preacher ever do that? And uh, he does do that, doesn't he? Uh, see if somebody maybe has a testimony or uh, a word of prayer or a word of praise or a scripture verse or something maybe the Lord's laid on your heart that you'd like to share tonight. Uh, anyone have something this evening? Amen. 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 Good. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah, amen. 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 Anyone else? Well, we're in Matthew chapter 9, if you want to take your Bibles and turn there for a little while tonight. We're going to try to uh, conclude this uh, thought on this fruit of the growing Christian life, the fruit of compassion. And our text we've been referring to was in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 down through verse 38. And uh, we find there that Jesus has uh, 
uh, begun his earthly ministry, and he's in the area here of Galilee, and he's just going throughout the villages and the cities, and, uh, and he's teaching the people, and he's preaching to them. Uh, he goes into the synagogue. That's where the people who were practicing the Old Testament Jewish religion would gather, and he would go in there and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, his gospel to them, and uh, he would... Uh, he would heal the sick, and he would uh, heal the, and help those that were diseased. And then the Bible tells us in the 36th verse that he, with his disciples, uh, stopped. And perhaps they were on a, on, a, on a hillside. I can see them maybe coming up over a hill and looking down into a village and seeing the people out and about on their uh, daily things and saying to his disciples uh, how moved he was as he saw them. And he realized that these people were, uh, they were fainting, not, not physically, but in their spirits, hopeless and helpless, and that they were scattered abroad, not having a shepherd, uh, like sheep without a shepherd to guide them and keep them from safety and harm and to bring good things to them. And instead, the religious leaders of that day were using them and uh, did not really care for them. They were self-centered instead of having a servant's heart. And it moved the Lord Jesus to compassion. And uh, we know that he told his disciples to, uh, to, to pray for a harvest of the laborers to go into the harvest. And so we've been looking at compassion. We said that compassion was that fruit of his spirit that made such a difference. And, and that he engaged the people. And he was empathetic toward the people. And, and the compassion makes a difference. Jude verse number 22. And then last week we looked at the conviction of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the compassion of Jesus Christ, but we're, look, we're talking about the conviction of Jesus Christ. And we said that our beliefs determine our behavior. What we believe to be true uh, makes us the people that we are. What we believe to be true sets our priorities. Uh, if, I, if I believe that my tire is flat, then I'm going to put some air in it before I try to drive it. I'm going to set that as a priority, and I believe that's true. And, and we establish values based upon what we believe to be true. I believe the Bible's God's word. It's the final authority of our life, and so therefore, therefore, my values should be biblical values. I should base my value system on the word of God. We preached not long ago about having an eternal value system. Uh, God's economy of what's valuable is different than man's and the flesh. And we want a biblical, eternal value system. <clears throat> and, uh, and Christ believed some things. And he knew them to be true. And we know that that's because he knew all things. He knew all things. He, he knew what, uh, what was going to happen the next day. And he knew what would happen uh, 70 years down the road. And he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And he knew some things, and because of what he knew, he acted with compassion based on his convictions. Convictions meaning what we strongly believe. What we strongly believe. We're convicted about this. And we said that one of those statements was, or one of the things he believed so strongly, was that the harvest was abundant. In verse number 37, he, he said uh, he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. And he used that word truly, meaning verily, having an emphasis on the fact that it was a plenteous harvest. And Jesus saw the people, and he saw them as souls standing in need, and he knew of coming judgment. He knew what was going to happen. And even though this was the beginning of his earthly ministry, and his passion, the death and crucifixion of Christ was still uh, some time off in the future, he knew that some of these same people might have been there that day in Jerusalem at Gabbatha where the people cried, Give us Barabbas. We will not have this man to rule over us. Crucify Jesus. And he knew that. He, he, he knew they would say, Let your blood be upon our hands and upon our children. And he knew that. And he knew that in A.D. 70 that it would literally come to pass as the as Titus came in and, and, and brought destruction and death upon them. And he knew these things. He knew them to be true. He believed that lost men died 
and would spend an eternity in hell. He knew that to be true. And we say we know that to be true. But may the Lord help us to have conviction about that thing so that it moves us with compassion to take action. And this is what he's talking about. There are billions who are in need of the gospel right now in the world, in our community, in our families. And Jesus Christ saw these lost souls. He knew that he loved them and that he was going to die for them. He knew that he would be buried and that he would rise again to save them. And he saw souls in the multitudes in the harvest field. He saw souls that could glorify him if they only were reached. If they were only uh, brought the message of Jesus Christ and brought the gospel message, then they could glorify him and they could, uh, they could be enlisted in the work of God, furthering the work of God. He saw the potential in the harvest, the potential of the harvest. And uh, I've never been a great big gardener, but I had a garden here and there as we've lived at places. And, and I had, uh, uh, I had uh, we bought a home when we were in Kingsport, and, and it, was, uh, it was in Fun Acres. That was the name of the subdivision because every house was on an acre, so hence the name. And uh, so we had a, a home and then a sloping backyard down into a big flat backyard. And, and I wanted to have a little garden there as Lydia was at that age where I wanted her to be interested in that and, and uh, try to help teach her some lessons that uh, I'd gotten taught tagging around in the dirt behind my grand, one of my grandfathers as he did a little bit of gardening. <clears throat> and, uh, and so uh, the first year, I got uh, a neighbor. My neighbor, I realized, had a tractor, and I got him to plow my garden. And we got to become friends. And every year then, I never told him. I never had to tell him again. He would just, when he did his, he'd come over and do mine. And every year, i look out the back window when I knew he was plowing my garden, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> every year. And, uh, and so you could look out over that big plowed up patch and all you could do was see the potential. And, uh, and so the Lord saw the potential of the harvest and he knew it was an abundant harvest. But he also knew he had a limited amount of time to get the harvest in. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day because the night cometh when no man can work. No man can work. And we're reaching the day where the time to get into the fields is drawing to an end. And when Jesus Christ comes again in the rapture, the first half of the second coming of Christ, there'll be no more reaping in those harvest fields. That crop will waste. And many who heard the gospel and refused it and rejected it will receive a, a, a delusion, a strong delusion. And they'll believe the lies of the Antichrist and the devil. And that harvest will waste. The waste, and the Lord knew there was a plenteous harvest. But we said last week, not only does he know the harvest is abundant, but he knew the laborers were absent. The laborers were absent. He, he said to them, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. The laborers are few. And even though the harvest is abundant and the time is now, there is still a shortage of laborers in the fields. And every child of God can be involved in some way in reaching the lost, reaching into the harvest fields. And we go through seasons of our life. There are times in our life, seasons in our life, where we ought to roll up our sleeves and get out physically in the harvest fields and go out there and knock on doors and try to, uh, try to get in the harvest physically. We should be involved in that. Then there's going to be seasons in our life where we are no longer able to do what we used to do. But that doesn't mean our compassion should wane or grow less. It just means we look for the way now that God has for us to invest in the work of the harvest prayer and investing uh, financially in the work of our church and, and through missions and outreaches. But all people, every child of God, can be involved in some way in reaching the lost for a lifetime. And Jesus Christ prayed for and requested prayer for the great need of laborers. And we have to see His compassion. And we have to believe that this is the desire of His heart for each of us. He had conviction, strong beliefs about these things that moved him to action. 
Pastor, how far did it move him? It moved him all the way to the cross of Calvary. The love that Jesus Christ had for us was, was uh, uh, demonstrated. Uh, Romans 5, 8, he commended, he showed openly his love for us. And that Jesus Christ died for sinners. And uh, we see his compassion. We know his convictions. We must believe with conviction that it is his desire for each of us to be involved in the harvest. To be involved in the harvest. Uh, I, I read this illustration somewhere. Well, I thought about it. I was preparing for this uh, lesson. And a little girl was helping her grandmother in the garden. And she was just a little girl. And I can remember Lydia. I, I think about her. And we would plant some corn. And we would have a couple or three, four big rows of corn. And we would put out a couple rows of uh, of, uh, of Blue Lake bush beans or something. I didn't have to string. And, and uh, we'd put out some tomatoes and some peppers and that kind of thing. And, and the one thing that I found out Lydia wanted more than anything was uh, sugar snap peas. And so we would put some of those out and, uh, and a couple nice rows. And then when the blooms would set and the peas would come on there, we'd go down and we'd, she'd get her bucket and I'd get my bucket and we'd go down. And, and I'd start, I would start picking peas and she would start picking them and eating them. That's what she would do. She'd just sit there and pick them and eat them fast as she could <laughs> and, and so her bucket would be empty and mine would be half empty because she ate them all but I could think about a grandmother out there you know and a little grandchild running around and in the garden and the grandmother uh, brings her out there and the corn is setting on the on the stalks and she's wanting the granddaughter's help and so the granddaughter goes with her and the granddaughter's so so excited at first to get out there and and pick the corn and and the grandmother tells her just how to pick it. And, and, uh, and boy, she worked just like a house of fire for just a little while. And then it wasn't very long at all that she became tired of that. She became bored with that. She goes up to her grandmother and she says, Grandma, you know that you can buy this at the store, don't you? <laughs> you know you can go buy this at the store, don't you? You know, for her, it just seemed like a, 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 re, a lost reward kind of thing, wasn't it? It was just too much to be invested in that for the reward. And uh, you can go and buy that at the store. You know, uh, that's sometimes easy for God's people to do in a sense when it comes to the harvest field. And, you know, it's sometimes easier to let others labor in the field while we stand back and don't get personally involved we like the harvest but we like it neat and clean and sitting on the shelf but somebody had to labor and work and sweat and get cut and get some calluses and and uh and 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 go through some some challenges before the harvest got brought in and sometimes for us uh, we want to uh, we want to uh, the harvest but we don't want to get personally involved it's easier sometimes it's easier sometimes to give that offering to missions and and by the grace of God I thought I, I pray every one of us want to do that that way we want to give that offering for missions and it's sometimes easier for some to tithe and give that tithe. And by the grace of God, we all should be tithers. True biblical tithers are 10%. Give it to the work of the church so the work of God can move forward. Uh, and it's easier sometimes to do those things and then excuse ourselves away from personally getting involved in the harvest field. Personally getting involved. Uh, there's no greater moment in life in our relationship with God than to know that we've been used to reach a soul, to have led that soul to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. There isn't anything any greater in our relationship with God than to know God has worked through us, uh, worked through us. We were yielded enough that God took us and used us and led a soul to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I can't think of anything in the world, you know, apart from our families. We, 
We want to we want to be a biblical mate to our husband or wife, and our great goal as parents is to lead our children to the to the Lord Jesus Christ and have their heart prepared to, to receive Him as their Savior, then to go on in life and serve Him. But apart from those things, to lead a soul to Jesus Christ, what a, what a, what a great, great privilege in this world that we have. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in the 6th verse, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he said, I have planted, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And here Paul takes that thought, that theme, maybe Maybe having heard from the disciples what it was Jesus said to them one day. Maybe, maybe Paul was there with some of those disciples, Peter, James, or John. And they said, you know, uh, have we ever told you about the day that Jesus told us about the harvest and asked us to pray for laborers? Maybe the disciples told Paul that story. And Paul thought about that in the sense of the illustration Jesus himself used. And Paul said, I've only planted the seed, and another Apollos has come by and watered, but my planting and Apollos watering really did nothing. It was God who gave the increase. God gave the increase. And Paul goes on to say that we are to be laborers together with God. He said, you are God's husbandry, and we don't use that term anymore. But in other words, God says, Paul's saying, God looks at you and I as a farmer, you're, you're a farmer, and I've entrusted you with good seed, the seed of the gospel, and God expects his people to get out in the fields with the seed and get out and bring in the harvest. Uh, so uh, we find every child of God should faithfully work in the harvest field, and not, not because it's easy. Uh, we don't choose to do it because it's easy. We don't choose to do it because it's an inexpensive thing. There's not a whole lot uh, more uh, expensive than farming. If you're going to farm in a big, major way, uh, those farmers, they're, uh, they're, they're depending on that crop to come in or they could lose everything they have. It's not, it's not inexpensive and it's not easy and it's not for success as an individual but because Jesus Christ has called us to go into the fields with him to harvest souls. This is why we should be involved. Psalm 126, and you probably have these verses marked in your Bible. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. And then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And that's a promise that, that God has made, and God cannot lie. God has made that promise. If we'll go forth with a heart with, of compassion, bearing the fruit of compassion uh, into the fields with the seed, God said, you'll not, you'll not return empty-handed. My seed will not return void. My word will not return void. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 1, <clears throat> he also promised us, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go 
into heaven. And my heart, my mind just imagines that if there were unwritten words that were said between those angels and those disciples, the words would have been, get your eyes off of heaven for the moment and get them back into the harvest field. This is the last thing he asked you to do. And don't wait. Don't wait because there's only so much time for the harvest. And those disciples were given the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit in them to go out and get in the harvest. Everyone who knows Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have received those promises. And when we believe His Word, when we're truly convicted of and believe the truth of the Word of God about souls and the harvest, we'll be moved by compassion to reach the lost. To reach the lost. We've seen the compassion of Christ. We've seen the conviction of Christ. But thirdly, let me give you the last point. The commission of Jesus Christ. Because look at what he says in verse 38. Pray ye therefore. And what's the therefore therefore? Well, it's there for whatever he just said. Because of what he just said, this should be the reaction. This should be the response. We've been looking on Sundays, and I've been saying this often, that the Word of God demands and deserves a response. And so the Lord has just said, look, the harvest is plenteous, the labors are few, therefore this is what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you, he says, to pray. For the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into the harvest. To send forth laborers into the harvest. Jesus Christ is the example of compassion for our lives. He's our example of compassion. However, his example of compassion must not be understood as an option of compassion. And uh, we know that it is also a command. We know that it is a commission for us to bear the same fruit of compassion in our lives. He says, be ye filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. That is not an option. That is a command. That is a commission to do this. And, and we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we're filled with the Spirit of Christ, we will bear forth the fruits of the Spirit. And one of them will be compassion. And so this compassionate example is not just an option or a suggestion uh, he he's commissioning them to pray he's commanding them to pray for others to join them the word prayer here uh, pray ye the word prayer it, it means to ask to beg uh, the idea is to have it, a sense of urgency about what you're doing we have we have the record of the one thing Jesus Christ asked us to do as he left this world the one thing and that was reach the world with the gospel of Christ. We call it the Great Commission. It's in all the gospel records. It's in the book of Acts. And here we have a record of one prayer request that Jesus Christ has commissioned his people to make with God, to, unto God with urgency and that's to pray for the need of laborers. Pray for laborers. God uh, is waiting for us to believe and be convicted and compassionate about praying for laborers to be sent into the harvest field. And, uh, are we engaged in those things? Are we engaged not only just in going, but in praying for laborers? And so here's the commission to pray. And then I want you to see, secondly, there's the commission to send. The prayer request is that laborers be sent, to be sent. Pray the uh, Father that laborers will be sent into the harvest field, every corner of the field, to reach every soul, everyone, everywhere. Mark 16, beginning in verse 14, he said, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said to them, Go you into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And you say, Pastor, sometimes I get asked about baptism's role in salvation. Doesn't the Bible say here that you have to believe and be baptized to be saved? I want you to look closely at that verse, verse 16, and don't be confused about it because don't stop at the semicolon. I hope you'll complete the thought. Because he says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And I want you to notice he doesn't say, he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. 
He only says believeth. Believing in Jesus Christ is the difference between heaven and hell. Not baptism, not believing plus baptism, just believing. A man that doesn't believe Jesus Christ is his Lord and Savior is going to spend an eternity in the damnation of the lake of fire. And so there's a verse of scripture you can give them. But I want you to notice he is saying to them, Go ye, go ye into all the world. The gospel is to be taken to all the earth and everyone on the earth. And this is true of every generation, the generation of those disciples, the generations to follow after them, our generation. We have the commission to reach our world and every creature in it with the gospel. And the gospel is to be taken, and this means everyone, everyone on earth, everyone in our family, everyone in our community. In Luke chapter 14, in the 23rd verse, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them uh, to come uh, in, that my house might be filled. Now, when I think about Jesus saying, Go into all the world, I get the idea of missions, missionaries, mission outreach. When I read him saying, Go into the highways and hedges, I get the idea of my community right where I live, the, the, the streets and lanes and the, uh, the community that's all around us. In Acts 1, verse 8, he said, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. And, and you know, this, this is obviously physically impossible for any local church to do. We, as a local church right here, we are not going to be able physically, us, us, to go out and reach every creature on planet earth. It's going to be a physical impossibility. But Jesus Christ never commissions and commands us to do what He does not have a way for us to do. And the way that we're involved in this is through supporting God-called missionaries. Men and women that God has called to reach the far corners of the earth, to reach into the harvest fields of the world where you and I are not going to go. We can support them and we can deputize and send them just as God, just as Christ told those disciples to pray, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers in the harvest fields. And I'm, my heart breaks every time we have a missionary couple who comes. Their heart is settled, they're convicted, and they're compassionate, and they're willing to go uh, to the mission field, and we cannot invest in them. We cannot invest in them. And may God help us to be sure we're doing all we can do in the area of giving so that they can go sending into the local church uh, what can be used to send the missionaries around the world. And, uh, and God has called missionaries to go. He's called you and I to go into the harvest fields. Well, how we, well, let's just conclude this thought and next Wednesday we'll begin a brand new fruit of the growing Christian life. But we know that compassion comes from having the vision that Jesus Christ has for others. It all began with him seeing the multitudes. He saw them. And we know his eye affected his heart. And the Bible said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that's what that verse is all about. God seeing, God getting involved and sending his own son, having compassion on you and me. It's all wrapped up in that one great verse of scripture. God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. And, you know, the question we ask ourselves as we look at these fruits of the Spirit, is our life bearing the fruit of compassion? Can, how can that fruit be seen in me? Am I praying for labors? Am I praying convicted that lost souls are dying every day, entering a Christless eternity? Uh, am I sending laborers? Am I giving uh, of the abundance of what God has given me uh, so that others can go that God has called? Am I showing compassion by sending and by praying for laborers and by getting involved personally, uh, seeing the eternal and not the earthly? Uh, we have been blessed by the compassion of Jesus Christ that he had on us. And it is his will that we be a blessing to others by having a compassion that Jude said will make the difference. The fruit of compassion, the fruit 
of a growing Christian life, the fruit of compassion, so necessary in our own hearts and in our own lives. And if we'll ask God and allow God and be spirit-filled men and women, we can have the compassion of Christ because it is Christ that lives in us. And he'll use our hearts and lives. We'll stop right there and finish up that thought. But I uh, hope you'll be here tomorrow evening at 6.30. And then uh, Saturday morning, 9 o'clock, we'll get some work done around here. Bus visitations at 10. And uh, then uh, our special sa Sunday services beginning with Sunday school, 9.30. And our gospel hour service at 10.30 with a special choir music. And then Sunday evening, we'll observe the Lord's Supper. So it'll be a special day. Well, we're going to pray together and be dismissed, and we appreciate folks uh, being here tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for your compassion, that you saw our need, and that, God, you were more than just uh, concerned and, and uh, Lord, more than just uh, in passing way. You, uh, you sent your only begotten Son. You got involved, Lord, and came unto us and uh, engaged our sin debt on the cross and was willing to give your life and, and pay the price. You labored, Lord, for us. And uh, Heavenly Father, we want the compassion, God, that you desire for us to have to be a fruit of our life. Lord, may we see souls. And God, may we see the shortness of the time and the hour. May uh, what we believe to be true, God, set our priorities and our values. And God, may we invest in the uh, those who are going and send those that uh, have been called. And God, may we ourselves uh, go into the harvest fields. And so we ask your blessings on these folks. Use us over the next few days as, as you would, Lord. And, and uh, God, we just pray you'll just bless and have your hand on Sunday in a special way. Uh, we have no confidence in our flesh, but in your word and in your spirit. And so we just ask you now again to bless these families and folks. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat>